Sometimes, to get to the bottom of what happened with an event in history, a trial needs to take place. This was the case for Will Britton, accused of conspiracy to murder James Cockrell. In today's video, we will walk through the newspaper account of both opening statements that happened during the January 18th through 26th, 1905 court session. And we will also talk about the stall tactics of the other conspirators. This will be a multi-part section of the feud, as there is a lot of testimony to go through and sort out the facts of the case. During this same time, attorney Markham's widow was also suing anyone that was associated with the Hargis faction, as well as there would be a Hargis trial take place for the death of James Cockrell. We will cover these three trials separately because there is a lot of information that does come out of them. As always, we will use newspaper articles and other documentation when found concerning this time in history. All aboard the Kentucky Tennessee Living Time Machine. Please fasten your seat belts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going, we need your help. We still need to fire up that time machine to transport us. Please help us by clicking on the like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons down below. Not only does this fire up the time machine, but it convinces YouTube that we need a bigger time machine to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now, back to our story. Jurisdiction Issues According to the report given in the Mount Sterling Advocate on February the 1st, 1905, quote, The indictment is found by the Grand Jury of Fayette under the statute of Edward the Sixth, giving jurisdiction to a court in either the county in which a crime was begun or in which it was finished. James Cockrell was shot in Breathitt County and died in Fayette County, so under this statute, the court in either county had jurisdiction. William Britton, now on trial in Fayette Circuit Court, is, as far as we know, the first man who has ever been indicted and tried under this statute. Unquote. Bravo points for originality to the prosecuting attorney, A. Floyd Bird, for thinking outside of the box. The juries in Breathitt County refused to take up the cases because of witness and jury tampering and intimidation. Byrd brought the cases before the jury in Fayette County to be tried. Warrants were also issued to the three Hargis brothers, Callahan and Jesse Spicer, deputy sheriff under Callahan. So we are talking about a county judge, a deputy sheriff, and an ex-senator all involved in this case. But, because of the issues with the men being very well connected in Breathitt County, a special meeting among the judges concerned took place in Jackson, Kentucky. From the same source, quote, A Fayette official was sent on Saturday to Jackson to serve bench warrants against the others indicted for the conspiracy in this murder. He returned without making the arrests. The Harguses claimed that they were under the jurisdiction of Edwards, a magistrate of Breathitt, who some weeks ago had taken up their case, according to the entries claimed to have been made on December 3rd and 5th, unquote. This would cause a huge quandary for the Kentucky State of Appeals as to who would have the jurisdiction of this case. Breathitt County and Fayette County would have an equal chance under the law to try the case. First, a representative of the Fayette Court was sent to Jackson, Kentucky to collect the men for trial. When this was not successful, the judges and attorneys for the Harguses held a conference. Quote, the conference held here Saturday between Judge J. H. Hazelrig, Judge J. Smith Hayes, Judge Lewis McCowan, attorneys for the Harguses, and Colonel John R. Allen, representing the Commonwealth, was short and to the point. Colonel Allen, taking the position that the time for the men to discuss the question of jurisdiction is after they have been arrested on the bench warrants and presented before the Fayette Circuit Court. To this, the representative of the men indicted on the charge of murder of Cockrell would not agree, and the result is the same as before the conference took place. The Harguses and Callahan continued to take refuge under Magistrate Edwards in Breathitt County, unquote. So the first round of mediation had failed, 
So the judges of Fayette County decided to meet face to face with the judges of Breathitt County. Judges Hazelrig, Hayes, and McGowan went to Jackson Saturday afternoon to confer with their judge counterparts. Officers were watching at Winchester and Lexington, expecting the accused to accompany the lawyers when they returned on Monday. A telegram was sent from Jackson on Sunday, saying the Hargises, etc., would go to Frankfurt on Monday. The Lexington Herald on Monday says, quote, Judge Hazelrig admitted that he gave out the statement himself to the Courier-Journal in response to an inquiry and that he mentioned the fact that the Hargises would accompany them just to test the public pulse in the matter, unquote. The lawyers came without the Hargises en route to Frankfurt, where on Monday afternoon, they presented to the Court of Appeals a petition asking for a writ of prohibition restraining the Fayette Circuit Court from taking any jurisdiction of these cases. The resolution to this case will be discussed in our next trial concerning these men. However, the Kentucky Court of Appeals will make their decision upon this question of the law in early March 1905. Opening Arguments for the Commonwealth of Kentucky Quote, On Wednesday, January 25, 1905, the Mount Sterling Advocate reported the following, Britain on Trial. Opening statement of Mr. Byrd contains sensational allegations. We clip the following from the Lexington Leader of January 18th. The case against Will Britton for the murder of James Cockrell in Jackson promises to be most interesting. When the court convened Wednesday morning, the trial began. There is a brilliant array of legal talent on either side. A. Floyd Byrd made the opening statement for the Commonwealth and was followed by O. H. Pollard, who made the statement of the defendant's case. Associated with Mr. Byrd are Colonel John R. Allen and C. J. Bronston of this city and B. A. Jollett of Winchester. C. W. Miller and Judge James Mulligan are associated with Mr. Pollard for the defense. Unquote. So, before we get into the opening statement, we have the dream team of the legal system of Breathitt County defending Mr. Britton during the trial. This was going to be a sensational trial as other men were also facing their own trials for conspiracy. Byrd's Opening Statements According to the same source, quote, The opening statement for the Commonwealth was made by Attorney A. Floyd Byrd who has done so much to rid Breathitt County of the assassins. We expect to prove that this defendant, Curtis Jett, James Hargis, Alex Hargis, Elbert Hargis, Ed Callahan, and others entered into a conspiracy to procure the death of James Cockrell, and that as a result of this conspiracy, James Cockrell was shot from a window of the courthouse at Jackson, from which he later died in this city. Mr. Byrd then explained the law under which Britton was indicted in Fayette County, where Cockrell died, and not in Breathitt County, where the fatal shot wound was inflicted. The proof will show that Cockrell arrived in Jackson about 11 o'clock in the morning of the day upon which he was assassinated. He had been away from Jackson and had come back to get his trunk and make his home elsewhere. The day Cockrell arrived, Britton was at the home of Elbert Hargis and that Albert Hargis went there for Britton, and that he and Britton left together and went to Jackson. About ten minutes before the murder, Albert Hargis, Curtis Jett, and Will Britton were seen going up the rear steps leading to the upper story of the courthouse. Britton was seen to leave the courthouse and go to the Hargis brothers' store and then return to the courthouse. He was not seen to leave the courthouse until after the shooting. Witnesses will testify, said he, that at least three rifles were extending from the windows of the courthouse and were fired in the direction of Cockrell, who fell at the second volley. Raleigh Cold Iron will say that he saw Curtis Jett and Will Britton at the windows of the courthouse at the time Cockrell was killed and from which the fatal shots were fired. Others will testify that immediately after the shooting, Jet and Britton were seen at the front door of the courthouse and that Jet had a pistol in his hand. It will be proved that at this time, Jim Hargis was seen at the window over his store and had a gun in his hands. 
proof will also show, he declared, that Jim Hargis and Alex Hargis furnished money for the defense of Curtis Jett and are also assisting Britton in his defense in the present trial, unquote. Britton's Confession Quote, says Britton admitted it. Mr. Bird said that the Commonwealth would prove that Britton had, since the murder, acknowledged to many people that he was connected with the conspiracy to kill Cockrell, and that after the conviction of Curtis Jett for this crime, Britton was heard to say, quote, If the truth were known, I pulled the trigger which fired one of the shots which killed Cockrell, unquote. So, if everything that the Commonwealth had laid out to the jury was true, it kind of looks like an open and shut case where Britain was concerned. But was everything in line as the Commonwealth thinks that it was? Let us take a moment to go through the defense side of the story. The defense opening statement. Quote, Pollard's statement. Mr. Bird was followed by attorney O.H. Pollard for the defense. He said he was astounded at the remarkable statement made by the prominent attorney for the Commonwealth and that he regretted that he had risked his reputation upon a statement made which contained nothing but a lot of rot. Quote, Many of the things Mr. Bird stated he would prove, unquote, said Pollard, quote, are incompetent and will not be permitted to be proved by a court. Of the 60 witnesses who are summoned by the Commonwealth, not more than 20 will testify, and these will not say one word tending to convict the defendant of this crime. Nearly all of them are liars and perjurers and are here to attempt to swear away the life of Will Britton. Mr. Pollard referred to the investigation of this case by the Breathitt County Grand Jury and that no indictment was found against Britton. He charged that Mr. Bird mysteriously came to Lexington with a number of witnesses and fooled a Fayette County Grand Jury into finding an indictment against Britton. The proof in the case will show that at the time of the shooting, Britton was in the office of the Master Commissioner in the courthouse and had been in that office for some time before the shooting, unquote. In next week's episode, we will get into the trial testimonies and what the papers say about them. Were they as the defense said and just lying? Or were they telling the truth about what happened with the death of James Cockrell? And why has history forgotten the trials of those accused of conspiracy of this crime? The jury. The members of the jury were reported in the Mount Sterling Advocate on February 1, 1905, after the trial had ended. The paper reports that 10 of the men chosen were Democrats and 2 were Republican. While political affiliation does not seem to play a part in most of our feuds and trials, but in this case, it seems to have a prominent role. Breathitt County was already at war with itself over which political party held the biggest sway with its voters and citizens. This is the very first time that we have seen it reported, and we thought it was very interesting that it was. The jury that was sat in this case is as follows. John Shea, foreman and ex-policeman. Lee Hancock, farmer. W.H. Thompson, Harness Merchant, John Randolph, Farmer, C.P. Foley, Contractor, J.H. Dozer, Dry Goods Clerk, John Funk, Farmer, E. Endiver, Carpenter, W.S. Van Meter, Farmer, W.M. Bateman, Contractor and Ex-Police Commissioner, John Richardson, Retired Merchant, and W.H. Alexander, Farmer. In 1905, only gainfully employed or property-owning men could sit on a jury. Women and others were not allowed to make decisions concerning guilt or innocence. This would change over time, but for now we see that the jury is made up of farmers, an ex-policeman, two merchants, a dry goods clerk, a carpenter, and an ex-police commissioner. In next week's video, we will start the testimonies of the witnesses and those that refused to show up for court. One witness was so important that a bench warrant was issued to bring him in to testify. Thank you. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Feuds. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. 
Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell for notification. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries in Appalachian history.